with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us God. Someone observed that the past 150 years have seen a great growth of democracy. And they've seen a great growth of corporations. And they've seen a great growth of public relations, which is a tool the corporate elite employ to undercut democracy and make sure it doesn't challenge the most undemocratic power and wealth of the corporate elite. Two branches of public relations are human resources management and industrial relations. Your employer has offices of one or both. The purpose of either is to keep you docile and productive on the job and powerless off the job. An interesting documentary film has come out. It's titled Human Resources. Like the Victorian novel, it's a bit of a loose baggy monster but many parts of it are very good indeed, and we'll be hearing some of them in a minute. Specifically, we'll be hearing parts of how they keep workers productive and, if not content, non-rebellious, at work, while the owners reap most of the fruits of the workers' increasingly unsatisfying and alienating labor. Let me gloss three key references that come up that perhaps could use a little more explanation. The first is Frederick Winslow Taylor. He's the industrial efficiency expert who showed how employers could disempower workers and reduce labor costs by analyzing every task into its many component parts and having each part performed by a worker with the least possible skills and as quickly as possible. The second reference is to the Kronstadt Rebellion. This was in Russia in 1921, right after the Communist Revolution. Soldiers, sailors, and civilians in the city of Kronstadt rebelled against their living conditions, and they demanded that a number of the Bolshevik communist structures Lenin had established be replaced with institutions more in keeping with true socialism. Lenin dispatched the Red Army and squashed that rebellion. The third reference is to the Hawthorne experiments. These were some experiments in industrial relations conducted in Chicago in the 1920s. The most interesting conclusion was that you could get workers to feel more content and to work harder just by pretending to pay attention to their concerns. The earliest form of managerial consulting dates back to the turn of the 19th century, at which time factory jobs dominated the workforce, and much like to today, managers were looking for ways to increase productivity and lower their costs. Some individuals during this time began applying scientific thought to management, with some of their resulting ideas, such as the Gantt chart, still being used today. In order to better understand where we are going as consultants in the 21st century, it's important to look back and understand the history of our profession. In this presentation, we'll explore these pioneers, these pioneers. The first individual we looked at was Frederick Winslow Taylor. Often described as the father of scientific management, Frederick Taylor grew up with a fascination for order and control. Born on March 20, 1856 in Germantown, Pennsylvania, Taylor is remembered by childhood friends for his scientific approaches to the most basic problems. For example, when playing baseball, Taylor would insist on taking detailed measurements of the field before the game so that all players could be spaced in perfect relation to one another. Once upon a time, the greatest theorist of the free market, Adam Smith, had warned that division of labor would create a catastrophe for human society. Frederick Taylor disagreed. In Taylor's view, there was far too little division of labor. Factories could be run far more efficiently if tasks were mechanized and broken down even further. In a series of experiments, he set out to reduce every task performed in a factory into individual units, measuring how long they took and setting targets for workers to meet. On its surface, scientific management seems like an excellent idea. Increased efficiency allows more products to be manufactured in a shorter amount of time. Yet there was another, more sinister motivation lurking in the background. Ever since the 19th century, machine shops had been a bastion of skilled labor. 
What this meant was that a considerable degree of power remained concentrated on the shop floor. The same skills that made production possible also enabled machinists to challenge management when they felt they were being treated unfairly. For management, this was an unacceptable bargaining chip. For Taylor, it was simply inefficient. You find that the man does not change very much, whatever else changes. They boast in the aeroplane world, it will take some other countries a generation to catch up with our quality. And it is not because their engineers are inferior, but because our ordinary workmen have a traditional skill behind them. Taylorism was certainly about de-skilling. It was about studying what skilled workers uh, did to decompose those tasks into their basic elements and then teaching people to do specific aspects of it without learning the, the entire set of or array of activities that were involved and are involved for a skilled person. Uh, in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism of control because you dictate to people, well, you do this part of the entire task and, and you don't do anything else and you dictate to 8, 10 or 12 people various specific aspects of the whole task rather than allowing a skilled person to decide how the entire task should be done. So there's a very much control involved there. To the degree that this involves de-skilling and involves control, it tends to take power away from workers, it takes uh, power away from therefore the collectivity of workers and therefore um, makes them less likely to be rebellious, makes them less likely to form various kinds of movements that would operate against, uh, let's say, broadly the capitalist system. So this is a, a something that management thinks is a good idea for the workers but is not a good idea for them. They have to be free to be to be creative. And in fact, Henry Ford, in, in his biography, said exactly that. Basically, he said something like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm too smart to have these kind of rational principles imposed on me, but those stupid workers out there, we need to impose those principles on them because they wouldn't know what to do if, if we didn't impose those principles on them. So rationalization, McDonaldization, is always something that those on top want to impose on, on the bottom, but something they don't want to affect their work at all. Henry Ford, in effect, invented the automobile assembly line and, and more generally the system that came to be known as Fordism. One aspect of Fordism had to do with hierarchical control over workers and more specifically the control over workers by the assembly line. So all a worker might do, for example, is put a hubcap on a car as that car went past as it was being constructed on the assembly line. So instead of a thinking, creative, skilled worker, you had a kind of mindless kind of worker who repetitively did the same task over and over again. Well, that kind of worker is robot-like. You are forced into a series of robot-like actions. The most interesting thing for me about McDonaldization or Weber's broader concept of rationalization is the idea of the irrationality of rationality. That these rational systems inevitably spawn all sorts of irrational consequences. This is supposed to be an efficient system, yet it ends up being very often inefficient. It's dehumanizing one of the kind of ultimate uh, irrationalities from my point of view. This is TomorrowPictures.tv. After high school, Taylor was accepted to Harvard but chose not to attend due to his failing eyesight. He then began work as a machinist at a steel company. While working at the steel company, he observed that many workers intentionally work slower when paid hourly in order to limit the amount of work they have to do. He called this process soldiering, and because of his obsession with control and order, this bothered him deeply. He went to work designing a system to increase productivity in the factory. He came up with what's called a piece rate system, which succeeded to increasing productivity. Taylor developed and implemented a differential piece rate policy that set in place an expected production rate per employee. Employees who exceeded this rate were paid higher, and employees who did not meet the rate were paid less. 
He went on to be hired by other companies as a consultant to design similar systems, but often was met with a common problem, opposition between managers and employees. His work began to be known as Taylorism. Opposition to Taylorism increased in the later years of his life as workers and unions complained that the system was unfair, and eventually even Congress investigated and ruled that Taylorism did not keep in mind the best interest of workers. Frederick Winslow Taylor died in 1915. The next individual in our study was Henry L. Gant. Henry L. Gant was born in 1861 in Calvert County, Maryland. Gant graduated from the McDonough School in 1878 and went on to the Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey. He was a teacher before starting his mechanical engineering career. In 1887, Gant's consulting career began. He worked alongside Frederick Taylor in applying scientific management principles in their work at Midvale Steel as well as Bethlehem Steel. Between the years of 1910 and 1915, he developed what's called the Gantt chart. The Gantt chart is a type of bar chart that illustrates a project schedule. It's used by project managers even today. The Gantt chart breaks down the start and finish dates of the terminal elements and summary elements of a plan. The chart also reveals a project's planned and actual progress. The Gantt chart helps organizations break down different elements of a project and can help companies decipher the roles each employee has. The chart also shows the dependency relationship between activities within a project. Use of the Gantt chart benefited from the development of uh, computers in the 1980s and 90s, and as stated before, the Gantt chart is still used today for project management. Frank Gilbreth was born to New Englander parents in Fairfield, Maine in 1868. After his graduation from high school in 1885, he was accepted to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, but chose to forego college to go directly into business. Gilbreth's career started in the construction industry as a bricklayer's apprentice. Here his interest in ergonomics and efficiency was sparked. He was devoted to finding the one best way of performing a task. As workers around the globe continue to struggle for workplace democracy and equal rights, mass production continues apace. Taylorism combined with human relations make up the cornerstones of worker management in the 21st century. In China, scientific management is taken on nightmarish proportions. So extensive is the division of labor that millions of people are forced to perform roughly the same motion thousands of times a day. In the United States, workers in some assembly plants are required to be in continual motion for up to 57 seconds a minute. In Indonesia, sweatshops owned by corporations like Nike chart productivity down to a thousandth of a second. In offices and service industries, corporations are increasingly resorting to video surveillance and computerized monitoring. Frank Gilbreth met Lillian Moeller in 1903 and began to help her complete her doctoral degree at Brown University. Once married, Frank's focus shifted from construction to industrial management. Frank's first book, first book, Field System, in 1908. This book was a collection of ideas gathered from men who worked in Frank's construction company. He asked for their ideas and recommendations for how to improve processes and tasks that they performed throughout their day. This was the first in a series of similar books detailing the tasks that workers perform. Frank's wife, Lillian Gilbreth, came to be known as the mother of scientific management. Lillian Gilbreth was born to German parents in Oakland, California in 1878. She was the oldest of nine children, three boys and six girls, and it was not expected by her parents that she should attain a college education. Lillian wouldn't need to work, her parents thought, but she desired education anyway. She enrolled at the University of California at Berkeley and earned her bachelor's degree in 1900 and her master's in 1902, both in English. While working on her doctoral degree in 1904, she visited Boston, where she met and then married Frank Gilbreth. Lillian worked to complete her doctoral degree at Brown University and published her thesis, The Psychology of Management, which appeared serially in the Industrial Engineering Mag Magazine from May 1912 to May 1913. She completed her doctorate at Brown in 1915. As we said before, once married, Frank's focus shifted from construction to industrial management. This is in part due to Lillian's interest in the field of psychology and how it can be applied to management. They began to lead the way in the new field of scientific management, all while raising 12 children. Frank developed the motion study, a study of the motion taken by a worker when performing a task. 
1912, Frank applied his motion study to the most delicate tasks of a surgeon. He then worked with Dr. Robert Dickinson to improve the management of hospitals. The integration of the Gilbert scientific management ideas in hospitals provided the foundation for modern hospital management. In 1913, the Gilbert started the Summer School of Scientific Management, which preached their philosophies of integrating psychology and education into management. The school was attended by professionals from all over the world and effect effectively established Frank Gilbert's reputation as a management consultant. They published their paper, Motion Study for the Handicapped, in 1917. This paper was prompted by the study of injured soldiers returning from World War I. Frank Gilbreth would watch the motions of wounded soldiers and teach them ways to manage the everyday tasks they needed to perform. Frank Gilbreth died suddenly in 1924, leaving Lillian to run a household of 12 children, including six girls and six boys. After Frank's death, the consulting firm they had founded failed, as many companies were hesitant to do business with a woman. This didn't keep Lillian down. She continued to hold workshops in her home, lectured, and wrote. In 1935, she was appointed in a part-time professor professorship at Purdue University in the management school, and continued there in 1948. She retired in 1968 and passed away in 1972. The individuals we've discussed in this presentation were pioneers in the field of scientific management, laying the groundwork for today's performance improvement professionals. Their work created and advanced the consulting profession as we know it today. So therefore we have to drive this backward population through industrialization by force and then later on by the iron laws of history and so on and so forth uh, will come the socialism. Of course it's all nonsense but uh, uh, so they essentially laid the basis for a totalitarian system uh, with an ideological doctrine behind it. When the Soviet Union collapsed, I actually wrote an article uh, saying this is a victory for socialism, small victory for socialism. I just couldn't get it published. Nobody knew what I was talking about. The world's two major propaganda systems, the West and the uh, Soviet Union, they both decided, made, determined to use the word socialism to refer to the totalitarian system of the Soviet Union. I mean, the West did it to discredit socialism, the Bolsheviks did it to try to gain you know, the credit associated with genuine socialism. Well, when the world's two propaganda systems agree, it's going to be very hard for people to extricate themselves from it. TomorrowPictures.tv Successes have been made in scientific research for afforestation and protection and management based on gene transfer making a contribution to afforestation, opening a prospect of more scientific afforestation and management. Besides, scientists and technicians in the field of science are successfully promoting the research suitable to the characteristics and conditions of the areas. This is TomorrowPictures.tv